Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture uh, today to be presented by a friend of mine who I have known for more years than I will probably want to disclose uh, since I think I first met, met Dr. Brakefield when I was a postdoc uh, and uh, had a wonderful opportunity to learn from her then and uh, have continued to since that time in the field that she's been working on, which is in the area of neuroscience and as you will hear today, a particular aspect of that, uh, an exploration of how extracellular vesicles released by glioblastoma cells uh, can play an important role in understanding biology and perhaps even in a therapeutic way. Uh, she is here today because of her role in the Common Fund Extracellular RNA Communication Program, one of those uh, bold initiatives that the Common Fund supports and that Xandra has played an important role in. Um, her curriculum is uh, beginning with an undergraduate degree at Wilson College, going on to get a PhD uh, right around the corner at Georgetown University. And then she came here, the NIH, uh, in the early 70s, where she was a postdoc with none other than Marshall Nirenberg, and uh, then continued as a staff fellow for another year. After that, she went off to the Ivy League, initially at Yale, which is where I uh, encountered her. Uh, in the Human uh, Genetics Department, and then uh, in 1984 moved from Yale to another Ivy League place you've heard of called Harvard, uh, where uh, she currently is Professor of Neurology and also is geneticist in both the Neurology and Radiology Services at the Mass General Hospital. She is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she won the Mika Salpeter Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society for Neuroscience, and a Special Achievement Award relevant to today's presentation from the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, ISEV. Uh, that was in 2015. Uh, her research has focused on the nervous system, but in a wide variety of interesting and innovative ways. And as I mentioned, she's here today to talk to you about one of those, namely, what can we learn uh, from extracellular vesicles about glioblastoma in terms of what they're up to? Interesting subtitle, saboteurs, uh, biomarkers, and therapeutics. Please join me in welcoming to the podium uh, Professor Sandra Brakefield. So I can barely see you above the podium. You know, usually they bring a box for me to stand on, but. I don't see you. I might have to kind of veer over this way. Well, maybe that's not going to work. If you can't hear me, because otherwise I don't think you can see me. Um, oh, 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 good. Okay, okay, great, great, great. So um, you just left out one little part of my NIH history, which was that after I graduated from Wilson College, I came here and worked as a technician for two years with Andy Lewis in virology. And the only other thing I would like to add is that. Um, I was upstairs um, and with the lab at Yale, and um, you were downstairs, and you taught a course in molecular biology. At the, t at the time, I was, didn't know anything about molecular biology, and I, but I was a single parent, and I didn't have time to go, and I've always regretted that. I was like, I, I could have gotten on so much faster if I had just, because I did go into molecular biology eventually. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about extracellular vesicles released by glioblastoma. Um, and try to give you some different aspects of that, but if we run out of time, you may hear less about the therapeutics. Right now, our major focus is on the saboteurs, and we've kind of passed on the biomarkers to a lot of other people because these vesicles really make fantastic biomarkers. Um, this is my disclosure statement. I basically just am a scientific advisor to a few companies. So here is glioblastoma, and I got into it by accident. Um, I was trying to work on developing virus vectors for gene therapy for neurologic disease. They all had a little toxicity. And my office was put next to Bob Martuza, who was a neurosurgeon. And I was telling him how frustrating it was that I was getting toxicity when I was trying to you know, cure the brain. And he said, oh, don't, I've got the disease for you. Don't worry about it. With the glioblastoma, you know, when we take the tumor out, we always take out normal tissue, so the, you know, the little toxicity we can live with. And we started working together on, uh, joined later by Nina Coco on oncolytic herpes viruses. But that's how I got started working on it. I would say in the time I've been working on it, 
Therapy for this disease has not changed, nor has prognosis. This is really one of your more dismal cancers. Um, and sometimes Nino and I wonder why we keep working on it, because nothing has changed in 20 years. You know, it's basically, I think they've gone from a lifespan of 12 months from the time of diagnosis to 15 months in that time. Um, we have learned, was, um, I would say, it's been difficult to improve therapeutic intervention um, for a lot of reasons, uh, which I don't need to go into, but that was one of the things that drove us into the biomarker field to try to track the tumors uh, without having to go back into the brain. The tumors are very heterogeneous with cancer stem cells. Even though there have been these four transcriptional classes, really when they did the single cell uh, RNA sequencing on tumors from um, individual humans, they find everything is in there. It's a, they're really very, very genetically heterogeneous. Uh, these are just some pictures. You know, this is the, the typical picture they show you. You've got a tennis ball in your brain. Um, but here you can see the very active metabolism and the very active DNA synthesis. And you think, oh, here it is, and we'll just take it out. But really, another feature of these tumors is they send invasive cells uh, just throughout the brain. So as soon as you take this guy off, another guy pops up here. So we were studying glioblastoma in the lab, you know, as basic researchers, and we had been using different models in mouse, mouse models. But the tumors that grow in the mouse models, the typical mouse gliomas, uh, they're not invasive, you know, they're not very heterogeneous, they don't even have the mutations that the humans have. So I um, said to my postdoc at the time, Johann Skog, you know, we need to get some fresh tissue from these glioblastoma patients and get it in the lab and let's see what we find out. And I've told this story a couple times today, but um, initially, you know, we're, we're PhDs, we do work right next to a hospital, but you know, we asked, could we get some fresh glioblastoma tissue? And the first two people we talked to said, there's no way, you know, it's, it's, we could get it to you within a few hours. I said, we said, no, we want to put it in culture, we want it right away. And then we talked to Bob Carter, who's now come back to be chief of neurosurgery there, and he just said, no problem, we'll scrub him in. So, we started getting a fresh glioblastoma a brain tumor tissue, and we put in culture. After about the third time, Johan came into my office and said, there's something, these cells are very weird. And you can see all these protrusions from the surface, and we were like, are they releasing these things into the, into the media? And he, sure enough, you see they release all these different size vesicles, ranging uh, over, well, down to 50 nanometers, actually, and up to tumors release a really broad range of size vesicles. Um, and that we, so we found there was a literature there where there was a great debate between whether these were vesicles or whether these were cellular debris that you saw in cell culture. Um, and we tried to figure out how many were released per day. It was pretty rapid. And then just because we're geneticists and we don't know how to look at proteins, we looked at RNA and showed that they do contain RNA. Most of it is under 200 nucleotides. You see some of the ribosomal peaks here, but if this was cellular RNA, these would be very big peaks. So we knew we had a source of uh, RNA from the tumors, but we wondered, um, well, let me just uh, talk a little bit about these vesicles. This is, this is from later work, um, kind of reviewed by other people, but in addition to what we saw, which were the RNAs, which the messenger RNAs, the microRNAs, the non-coding RNAs, and we've also found some DNA, there's a lot of uh, different kinds of proteins in here involved in antigen presentation. Uh, presentation. Um, there's enzymes, there's transcription factors. So this is a whole boatload of stuff into which there's a little RNA. And probably, I think you've had a lot of lectures on, on uh, vesicles, so I don't think I need to go into this too much, but there's at least two routes of production one is through multivesicular bodies that are generated from endosomes, and they just kind of fuse with the plasma membrane and dump these out. Typically, those are called exosomes. And then there's other uh, vesicles that bud from the membrane surface, almost like retrovirus, um, and those are typically called microvesicles. And they can do things like present antigens, stimulate cell signaling from the outside. They can enter, um, and the their contents can be active in the cells. Even messenger RNAs, if typically smaller ones of, of about 1 kb, can be translated in the cells. The microRNAs can be active. Um, they're also taken up by endocytosis. 
and they have, um, can stimulate MHC molecules on the surface, et cetera. So there's a lot going on there, and this is, I think, one of the problems. It's like taking a little biopsy of the cell. I mean, you have a lot of the components of the cell there, and trying to factor out what's doing what is one of the issues in the field. Um, just suffice it to say here, early on it was recognized um, that this could be a new form of, of intracellular communication because you would be able to transfer these RNAs and DNA and proteins, cytosolic proteins, even membrane proteins that are not typically in the what I call the secretome of the cell. So they're not normally secreted, but you can transfer them over in these packages. And then uh, people have shown that the proteins on the surface can be active in signaling. Um, there's proteins, transcription factors that can turn on genes. You can, RNAs can make proteins. RNAs can potentially become um, double-stranded and insert into the genome. Just, it's almost like anything could happen day, or what was that wacky Wednesday or whatever. So it's almost, when you started, I mean, everybody got excited because of all the potential there was here, but um, it's, we're still in the process of trying to decipher it. And I, I look at it kind of like, this is a new language of communication between cells. There's a, the words, a lot of components that I've talked about, but these components may act in concert in ways that you may not anticipate. Um, and it's always communicated as a mass, okay? It's, you're not, it's people, oh, you always see this paper, oh, there's, and we do a little of it too. There's mirror 21, mirror 21 in the vesicles, and mirror 21 knocks down the messages and the cells, and so that's what the exosomes are doing. But in fact, it's a collective mass. And whatever happening is happening through a lot of, of proteins, RNAs, et cetera, interacting together. And this is an even harder thing to study. It's bidirectional. You know, all cells are releasing them, and all cells are taking them up. So it's, it's not even a simple you know, one-to-one -one arrow going out. There's, as I said, there's different kinds of vesicles and particles. Um, some are probably junk mail. Um, and, the, and different vesicles and cargos probably have different messages in them. Um, and another issue that we're still trying to figure out is like who talks to who, if this really is a communication system in the body, you know, which cells are trying to tell which cells to do what. So back to brain tumors. Um, I've been interested in the potential for cellular communication in the context of the brain tumor. And that's where I come into saboteurs because they're not in there for to be nice guys, for sure. So your tumor develops, um, and there's a lot of things that have been associated with the vesicles released by the tumor, uh, immune suppression, stimulation of migration and invasion, epigenetic changes, angiogenesis, et cetera. So we, you know, we're interested in brain tumors. We're trying to figure out how, how, why they have such an advantage. What are their Achilles heels? We felt that you know, we wanted to try to understand this better. Um, one of the things we did was to label the cellular memories, and other people have done this, it's not unique with us, um, with a meristillation or um, pomidillation signal so that you can fuse that to a fluorescent protein. It labels all the membranes in the cells, but as you can see, it labels the vesicles very distinctly, so we know this gives us a way to follow them. Hmm. Oh, what happened? I don't think I did anything wrong but I have a friend back there who's going to help me. So um, using these labeled cells in culture, you can see here's a, these used to be movies that I got so frustrated showing movies. Anyway, you would see that here's a cell, it forms these vesicles on the cell surface. These are tumor cells, and they just then get released. And you can almost see it like in real time. They're just, it seems like it will be energetically pr prohibitive, but they just seem to keep releasing them. And this is, with intravital microscopy, I'll show you another picture of that. An again, another tumor that's labeled, and again, in vivo, you see these vesicles uh, just budding off and being released into the environment. And the person that did this intravital microscopy for us is Torsten Memphel. He's an amazingly uh, talented investigator. So here, the tumor cells are labeled with a red fluorescent protein. The myeloid cells, which would be the microglia and the macrophages that invade the tumor, are green. But you can see, and you can see it in real time, that these vesicles get released and they get taken up by these myeloid cells. 
So there really is, these really are released in vivo and they really are taken up by the surrounding cells. Now, we get back to you know, what constitutes a tumor and how does it sustain itself in the brain? So we know that it basically molds its microenvironment. It's going to take over the brain, literally. Um, it does this by secreting cytokines. Um, it does it by signaling through you know, proteins and receptors on the cell surface. And you know, does it do it also by these extracellular vesicles that are released by the tumor cell in great abundance and taken up by the normal cells? Um, so in this environment, you, know, you think of all the normal uh, constituents of the brain, like neurons. Um, but really, if you actually look at the brain tumor itself, most of it consists of microglia and macrophages. It's reacting to the presence of this tumor in a big way. They are attracted to the tumor, and um, the tumor is going to subjugate them, is a good way to put it. So we decided initially, again, taking the primitive approach because um, that was the way we were looking at it, that you know, it was a big, the big heyday of microRNAs, and we said, okay, what's the, what are some of the highest upregulated microRNAs in glioblastoma, and can they be transferred to the, these microglia? In this case, we picked microglia. We picked microglia because they were easier to grow than macrophages, okay? But there's no great insight there. Um, so glioblastomas typically have very high levels of MIR-21, and it's very high uh, in the vesicles. Now, this is a cautionary note. Initially, we thought this MIR-451 was our guy, and, was gonna, and we were tracking it, but it later turned out that is an artifact of serum. So this, that's another re it was the reason why people now say vesicles tend not to use serum. So this is a, there's no difference in the sequence between human and bovine 451, but even if you have, even if you have what they call vesicle depleted serum, you have a lot, a ton of this MIR-451 present. So these are some of the things we're learning along the way. You'll find a lot of papers on MIR-451 and how it helps to suppress you know, things in microglia, et cetera, but it's really just present in the serum of the cultured cells. So as I said, we picked microglia um, because there are they were relatively easy to grow, and they were a major constituent of the tumor. We were very fortunate uh, later to discover that one of our colleagues on the floor, Joe L. Curry, and his wife, Suzanne Hickman, were microglia experts. And basically, microglia are sentinels in the brain, so they're supposed to sense if you have any infection, et cetera. Here, again, and they send out these processes, and they're always feeling around and trying to figure out what's going on. Here, in, uh, Suzanne did a laser-induced in injury. The green or the microglia, you can't see it here, but where she introduced the injury, they all just rush into that spot. So they're very, very sensitive to changes in their environment, and in the case of an infection, are going to try to get rid of the infection. So we set up a little model system initially. We knew that the glioblastoma cells had high levels of MIR-21. Microglia had low levels. We thought this would give us a good chance to look at transfer. The vesicles had high levels, and when we looked in the microglia that were exposed just to the vesicles in culture, we saw we, we did raise uh, MIR-21 levels. Uh, it also, the cells started proliferating more rapidly. Target messages went down, and there were other changes in the cells. So now, we published that paper, and everyone has always said since then, um, well, it, it's not necessary because, again, the MIR-21, you can't distinguish it, even if you did human and mouse, it's the same sequence. Maybe you didn't, the MIR-21 didn't actually come from those EVs, maybe you just changed the physiology of the cell. But I just heard today from one of my um, students that we now have, actually we've done this, he's done this in mice, and I'll show you how we do those experiments, knocked out from MIR-21, and yes, the MIR-21 levels do go up, and since the mouse is knocked out from MIR-21, they have to be coming from tumor. But that study is still a work in progress. So we set up, uh, actually, Nick Moss, uh, and I had to someone here, talk to someone here who knew, knows him. He's from the Netherlands, so it was Eric Abels, actually. Um, we just decided to see if, within the context of the brain, and with the context of a brain tumor, 
Do microglia who have taken up more tumor vesicles have a different phenotype than microglia that have not taken up very many tumor vesicles? So the tumor is labeled. This is a mouse glioma in a syngeneic uh, animal model. Uh, they're implanted in the brain. We wait, you know, about a month, sacrifice the brain, do the immunohistochemistry, and then in parallel, we generate a single suspension of cells from the brain that we separate by fax analysis. Now, this was another thing where I told the, the students, and the, you know, this is not a good idea. You know, if you try to dissociate the cells from the brain, you know, all the process is going to get sheared off. Everybody's going to die. This isn't going to work. But as is typical of my lab, they just did it anyway because that's what they wanted to do. Um, well, first of all, here's just a picture of the tumor. Um, so the tumor is labeled with GFP. Um, the macrophages are labeled with um, CCR2. The microglia are labeled with IBA1. And this is just to show you in the tumor how dense these microglia and macrophages are. And people have known for a long time that the more microglia and macrophages in a tumor, the worse the prognosis. So them being there isn't, you think they went in there to try to save the day? No, they're, they're causing trouble. So this is now the dissociated brain, tumor-bearing brain. And we just have different controls here. We separate the microglia by having um, high CD11B and intermediate CD45. And you really just have to come down. These are just all controls, basically. In the end, we take these microglia and we separate them based on the level of GFP. So the more they've taken up vesicles, tumor vesicles, the more GFP they should have. And there's not a lot of them that we isolate at this point. But we were fortunate enough to be down the hall from David Ting, who did the single cell uh, messenger RNA sequence, deep sequencing on glioblast tumor, tumors. And he said this was plenty of cells for him, no problem. First of all, and I, I show this because at one talk somebody questioned, with the deep RNA sequencing analysis of the microglia that we isolated by facts, in fact, they do show the transcriptome of microglia. So we did isolate microglia. And if you look at a, a kind of all the different messages that you see expressed, one thing we noticed is that in microglia, if you compare now the ones that, are, that took up the GFP vesicles versus ones that didn't. Now, it's not to say that these didn't take up some. These took up more, for sure. So there's a, definitely a, a differential in the amount of GFP expression. There are big differences in RNA levels of specific RNAs in the microglia that took up the vesicles compared to the macrophages, which just seem to have you know, eaten them for dinner. They don't, they, the vesicles don't seem to have made a big effect on the tra transcriptome of the macrophages in the vicinity of the tumor, whereas the microglia were strongly affected. And this is just showing you this unsupervised clustering. At first, when you look at it, you don't go aha and aho, but um, these are your control microglia. You do go aha and aho that the ones in the tumor-bearing brain are very different. And there are subtle differences um, between the ones that we had taken up the tumor, a lot of tumor vesicles, and the ones that had. This slide just is to show that, you know, when we look at a messenger RNA expression, especially for proteins that go up uh, in response to the tumor being present, they go up at the RNA level and they go up at the protein level. That's just another kind of control there. So Joel Curry is a big expert on the transcriptome of microglia, and he has divided the different uh, transcripts into um, different functional pathways. His favorite pathway is the sensosome pathway. This is the path, these are the proteins that they use to sense that there's a problem in the brain, like you stuck a laser beam in, you did neurosurgery, you got an infection. And the thing to, you know, you can look at these, <clears throat> EGF being negative versus the positive. And what you tend to see is that most of these transcriptomes are going down, and they're going down more when the GFP cells were positive, when the, when the microglia were positive for the tumor GF, derived GFP. There are some that go up, but mostly it's almost like they're putting a blindfold on. Like the tumor puts a blindfold on these and says, I'm not here, basically. 
Then we looked at other pathways that he's associated through his other studies with um, development of the brain and with tissue repair, and you can see those are going up. So it's almost like the microglia, first of all, they put blinders on, and then they like, you know, hail friend, well met, they kind of try to support the tumor. Um, and then if you look at some of the um, transcripts that are involved in immune functions, you see a lot of upregulation of ones that are involved in immune inhibition. And we know, of course, in the brain tumors environment, there is a lot of immune inhibition. And even one here that's, um, that's downregulated that would have helped with immune activation. So just to kind of cap that, this is a, this is a slide that um, Joe put together. But basically, it's hard to read it, but it will get better to read. Um, microglia functions under the influence of glioblastoma. Okay, so these guys are being taken over. Their normal functions are warrior, a sentinel, and nurturer. And why isn't this going? So, what happens to their warrior functions? This is where they would be fighting back, you know, infection or something. Well, it's weakened. They have a decrease in toxic peptide, peptide release, a decrease in phagocytosis. They show no inclination to fight the tumor at all. Uh, in terms of sentinel functions, they're basically disabled. It's as if they are blinded to this intruder. And the nurturer function, which is supposed to promote tumor growth and um, immune suppression, they basically, these nurturer functions, they seem like they're actually trying to, as if it's a developmental scenario and they're trying to help the tumor to develop. I, the way I try to describe it, it's almost like they've decided they have a little baby in, that's growing in them and they are going to take care of it. So that's kind of where we are with the story right now on the saboteurs, but I think we're now trying to devise methods to try to get rid of these microglia, um, you know, using more of a gene therapy approach and using the promoters that are upregulated um, in these microglia compared to normal microglia, and we'll see how that goes. But I do think, I guess the, the only thing that gives me, after 20 years of studying glioblastoma, the only thing that gives me hope is we keep finding out new things. There may be an Achilles heel in here somewhere. You know, we just keep perturbing it. Okay, so what about as extracellular vesicles as biomarkers? This is something that no longer needs to be, you know, stated. It's, it's happening. There's even products emerging. Um, all cells release them to varying degrees, um, including tumor cells. They're found in all uh, biofluids. This is especially important in the case of a brain tumor where you don't want to have to go in and take a biopsy. Um, they're a mixed array of vesicles, but they contain a lot of information, proteins, RNA, et cetera. They're relatively stable in circulation. And it's very interesting, their stability after isolation. We've you know, isolated the vesicles from serum of our patients left it out on the bench for two days, measured the RNA with a bioanalyzer, and it's perfectly intact. There, it's, it's completely protected in that, in that, within that vesicle. You can use um, proteins that are expressed on the cell surface um, of your whatever tissue you're wanting to analyze and use them to enrich for the vesicles, and we've done a lot of that work, but I'm not gonna talk about it right now. And that increases your sensitivity and selectivity for markers. Um, and I mentioned the information. So when we first thought about this, and this was like our, I, I, I have a slide I want to put in here. Because it is, you know, you, it, a few times in your career, you have one of these light bulb moments. Like, so we found the vesicles. We showed they had RNA. And then we're like, you know, the blood tumor barrier is kind of weak. What if some of them get into the bloodstream? And then we're like, well, what could we look at? that would be tumor specific, that you know, would never be in the bloodstream if um, you didn't have a tumor, and where we could have primers that we could never pick up the normal message. You know, it was like we were just on a roll. But um, the problem with brain tumors is that, as I said, all the cells are releasing vesicles. So you've got vesicles coming from endothelial cells, macrophages, et cetera, lymphocytes. And now, especially in the case of a brain tumor, you're just going to sprinkle in a few of these glioma uh, EVs. And that compared to what people, people have made much greater progress with peripheral tumors because there's a lot more tumors from those, I mean, vesicles from those tumors in the blood. But even for glioblastoma, we were successful. So we targeted um, initially EGFRB3. This is a deletion um, in the EGFR gene that's, that's quite common in 
glioblastomas. Um, it has a poor prognosis. But there's a lot of um, agents that are being developed, including vaccines, to target this particular mutation. Um, and then there's the mutant IDH1-2. This is a very critical mutation. It's now the first divider in the HUE classification of tumors because you're a completely different entity if you have this a mutation in isocitrate dehydrogenase. Um, it's typically in lower grade tumors, better prognosis, and they are developing um, drugs that target those mutants, that are mutant specific. So this is actually data from Bob Carter again. Here he uses CSF from patients that, that and he gets the status of the EGFR V3 from the tumors, and then he looks in the CSF, which was more sensitive than the serum. And basically, um, he gets very high specificity and um, modest sensitivity. So this is something still a work in progress to pick this up. We have picked it up from serum, but our pickup rate is even lower in serum. Um, and then someone, uh, and I don't know who initially had the idea, said, you know, why? So people are looking at um, circulating tumor cells. They're looking at um, cell-free DNA. They're looking at, you know, ex extracellular RNA in serum. And why should you just look at one? I mean, they all have information, right? So this particular, uh, in this particular study, they said, Maybe the, the free circulating DNA comes from dying tumor cells, so we shouldn't, we want to see who's dying. And then the living cells producing these vesicles can give us a, a portrait of what's, of the mutational status of the tumor cells that are still living. But you basically, you're getting a double whammy here. You're getting, you're, you're collecting two informative sets of um, genetic DNA from the, from the uh, serum, and here, when we did, when Leonor Balage in the lab did that for um, the IDH1 mutants, this is in plasma, she was able to distinguish um, the IDH1 mutant carriers from the healthy ones. So I think, as I said, that, that has a life of its own now. Johann Skog has a company. Probably shouldn't say the name because I may be, but it's Exo Diagnostics, and we're very proud of him. Okay. Um, I might add, as I mentioned before, that this, um, especially the extracellular RNA, if that's not just in the vesicles, it can be in RNP particles, et cetera, in a stable form, is being used uh, as biomarkers for neurologic diseases, myocardial infarction. This is just funded by the um, extracellular RNA consortium, um, kidney disease. I mean, there's a huge effort um, of laboratories, and they, they find markers, and I think an important thing that the ERCC is doing is to standardize the protocols and get very large reference pedigrees and put these in big databases so you can try to see what is real, what's real and what isn't real. And now, in my last, oh, I have plenty of time, I wanted to talk about their potential use as therapeutic vehicles because that's, somehow I always get back to therapy. Um, and there's a lot of effort in this area now. I'm not going to describe in detail. The, most people are just trying to isolate vesicles from, let's say, mesenchymal stem cells and grow them in large amounts and load them and use them. Um, and that looks very promising. And that's not quite the strategy that we're taking, but uh, hopefully you'll get the, the idea. So they can be tamed for many cell types. As I said, everybody's releasing them, so you can use mesenchymal stem cells, you can use dendritic cells, you can use iPS cells, whatever cells you have in the patient. As I mentioned before, once you get your DNA RNA into them, or protect, they're protected, and so they're, it's relatively stable. Of course, once you put them into the body, they get taken up primarily by the liver um, in gobs, um, but they're efficiently taken up by all cells and they can potentially be targeted to specific cells in vivo, although that remains something of a challenge. This is just one, um, aside from Samer L. Andalusi, who's involved in this, and this is just to show you some of the other things that people are using. They're using them for antigen presentation, for vaccination, they're using them um, for immune modulation, for tissue repair. You'll see lots and lots of papers coming out of this, and I think it's gonna take a long time till we sort through and see what works and what doesn't work. This is just an example of loading. Um, you can put sequences into your RNAs that will um, facilitate their going into the vesicles. 
You can get proteins in by oligomerizing them with the membrane. You can just overexpress your RNA. You can put viruses in them, like AV can be put in vesicles. Or you can isolate the vesicles and put in your RNA or your proteins uh, by other methods. So methods are being worked out to load them with specific therapeutics. I wanted to talk about our work on schwannomas. So after working you know, for 20 years on glioblastomas and having many of our therapies go into clinical trials only to have no benefit, I was like, maybe you know, I should try a benign tumor. I, this might, I might have better chances. So I picked um, schwannomas. And basically, uh, there's three diseases, hereditary diseases primarily, where the Schwann cells, um, if they lose like a tumor suppressor gene, in the case of NF1 and NF2, will form tumors on the Schwann cells or on the nerves, and they're usually benign. Um, but they can they cause motor dysfunction, pain, hearing loss, depending on where they occur. And this one, actually, NF1, is one of the most common. It's very common in the human population. Um, with one in 3,000 carriers. And the current treatment is basically just surgical resection. But that can, as you might imagine, cause nerve dam damage and is not even usually done. Here's Scott Plotkin, who is our, the director of our neurofibromatosis clinic, just showing you in a uh, MRI in an NF2 patient. So about 50% of the gene carriers have tumors. and. The average volume is 83 milliliters, which you can see they form all along the um, nerve fibers at the base of the, the spine, et cetera. They can cause very serious problems, but they're not malignant. So all we have to do is reduce their size. This just actually shows you some of the um, more serious ones, which are these vestibular schwannomas that form along the eighth nerve and cause deafness. So we made a model where we took a human Schwann cells from an NF2 patient that are NF2 minus. Um, we implant them in the sciatic nerve of nude mice. Uh, they form tumors, and we you know, worked out a schedule where the tumors would reproducibly form over a period of time. These are not, these schwannoma cells have actually been immortalized with, um, uh, it's actually an E6, E7. So they actually are a little more transformed than would be a normal schwannoma which I think makes them not such a great model, but it's the best one we have for now. So we had the idea that we should take, um, this is a, like a wimpy little caspase, caspase one, normally involved in development, hook it up with a promoter, P0, that's exclusively active in Schwann cells, and um, make an AV vector, and that we would inject that into the tumors to shrink them. So one thing I just want to point out here, I've done this work with Gary Brenner and Julia Filsey, if you took an AV vector, and, this, and we tried different serotypes, okay? So this is like a good serotype, AV1, for these type of tumors. And we expressed GFP. You can see when we do our injection, we only hit about, if we're lucky if we hit 10%, actually, of the cells within the tumor. But if we inject this P0 ice, that's with P0 GFP, P0 ice, you can see we get a large number of apoptotic bodies. So there, there is what we call bystander effect. When these cells, um, when a subset of cells gets this caspase one, other cells around it start dying off too. So in the tumor model, here we, do, we use the GFP control, but you can see the tumor grows um, if you put GFP in it, but if you put in this um, P0 ice, it basically regresses. Here's, or it never grows here, and here it regresses. So it looks a little promising. Um, if you look, actually look at the nerve uh, themselves after this treatment, they actually look perfectly normal, which surprised us. But um, they see, once you get rid of the tumor, they just seem to um, normalize. This is just to show kind of a therapeutic effect. So here's the green is the tumor signal, because we use a bioluminescence tumor signal. So here the tumor is growing. We inject the vector. The tumor shrinks. And here is a measure of pain. So the higher this is, they basically take different fibers and press them against the, uh, the palm of the animal. And if they're sensitized to pain, they, they get a reaction sooner. So as the tumor starts growing, 
the animals become more sensitive to this type of pain, but once you regress the tumor, they, go, they normalize. So all this looks kind of promising. Um, and where do EVs come into this? Well, we haven't specifically proved it, but this is our theory. Caspase is known by other investigators, Caspase 1, 2B, incorporated into EVs. I think almost any protein can get incorporated into EVs. But here, if we took like cell free conditioned medium from cells that we'd infected with our vector, you can see it kills other Schwann cells. So there's something in that media that's killing the Schwann cells. If you mix them, you know, transfected and untransfected, again, you can kill them. So we have hypothesized, you know, EV transfer of caspase 1 because caspase 1 isn't normally secreted, so you'd have to get it out in EV. And this is our theoretical uh, model. So here's the, the nerve fiber surrounded by the Schwann cell sheath. We have a schwannoma forming. We inject A, B vector. We only hit a small proportion of the cells with the vector, but then potentially the, um, and we have a little more evidence on this, but I, for now we're, we're gonna let it go here. Um, the vesicles now contain, that are released by the infected cells now contain the caspase one, and they lead to death of other Schwann cells, and you start getting this tumor regression. So that's, that kind of covered the three topics. Um, I want to thank the NCATS and the ERCC. I think they've done an amazing job of, of helping these, these, um, this information on, ex especially extracellular RNA, go forward in all three directions. You know, the normal biology of it, the biomarkers, and the therapy. They have a great website, xRNA.org, where they put all kinds of data and protocols and everything, so it's a, it's a really valuable resource. This is just a picture of some of the people in my lab. Charles Lai did a lot of the work. There's Nick Moss, Eric Abels, um, Christina Fries, just to see a few faces. Oh, there's Leonardo Balage, Ben Georgi. And then here's just a list of the people. It probably doesn't list everybody, but um, I've had a lot of people from the Netherlands um, in my lab. I, I would say at least half of those are from the Netherlands. I, I, became, I became a popular spot for visitors from the Netherlands. Um, Joel Corey has given all the, uh, the uh, expertise on um, the microglia and torsten mempho on the intervital imaging, and David Tung has done, Tung Ting has done the deep sequencing. I, my funding sources are all NIH, um, and I do want to thank um, two program officers who I think have really, um, because of their, their real vision and wisdom, uh, Bill Timmer and Kevin Howcroft, who actually, you know, in the old days, whenever I would call my program officer, I felt like I was talking to a recording, you know, I'd say, how did it go? And I would get a recorded answer, he'd press one and press two. But it seems to have changed. The program officers now actually understand the science and they can kind of guide you and that's been a, a big breakthrough, I think. So thank you. Just stand up here. Well, thanks for an interesting romp through three different aspects uh, of extracellular vesicles and how they might apply in neuroscience. We have time for questions. The microphones are in the aisles awaiting you. If you have a question to ask, please use that so people watching video uh, can hear. And maybe we'll start right over here. Hi. Uh, this is more of a comment regarding MIR-21 levels, whether they're endogenous or coming from the vesicles. So the way uh, we had the same issue and the way we uh, tackled it was to measure the premier in the recipient cells, assuming that there would be an upregulation also in the premier. And once you don't see that, you assume that it comes from the vesicle. I see. Yes, that is a good way to do it, yeah. Interesting. Over here. Oh, that was a fantastic talk. So my question is, you say that the tumor cells release extracellular vesicles, which get recognized by the normal cells and incorporated, and those normal cells become tumor-like. So, and you also said that it's in biofluid, like breast milk. So what if uh, cancer patients are a mother who's giving a, a like, breastfeeding? Does that mean that their babies are actually being, you know? Yeah. Well, I didn't actually say that the vesicles from the tumor cells immortalize other cells, but there are other papers that say that. Yeah, and I would say um, this has been a concern for some people that, um, you might be able to transmit immortalizing um, genes or RNA, um, especially like you're thinking breastfeeding or something like that. 
I had the FDA ask me once, they said, well, when we make a vaccine, you know, it's filled with these vesicles, and the cells we use to make the vaccine in are usually immortalized, so is, are these immortalizing proteins going, yes, they are going into the vesicles, whether that would be enough to actually, you know, cause anything is another issue, but yeah, it's a very interesting point that a lot of people are very, you know, interested in, and, um, and I think it's a reason that I would say you know, when people talk about, oh, what cell line are we going to use to isolate our vesicles from, from therapeutic purposes? A number of groups have gone to 293T cells, and I'm like, you got to be kidding. You know, they are loaded with oncoproteins, and, you know, you really should use, like, mesenchymal stem cells or something like that. I don't think I'm one in that area, but I have, I have my opinion on it, but I, I agree with you. It's, 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 Sandra, it's, let me ask a follow-up of that, because uh, the questioner uh, proposed a circumstance where these would be presumably delivered orally, uh, in this case from mother to baby. There was a paper four or five years ago that got everybody all very excited uh, that purported to show that you could in fact detect uh, vesicles in uh, the blood of people who were vegetarians and that those vesicles contained microRNAs of plant origin, mm -hmm. and even that those actually affected gene expression in the liver of those people who had mm -hmm. been eating a lot of those particular plants. That was enormously exciting, if true, because it suggested a way of a gene environment interaction. But I gather there has been some question about whether that can be reproduced. Where, where do we stand on the idea? Because obviously, if you're going to use these therapeutically, and you could just, you know, take a, 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 a liquid solution as opposed to uh, having be injected, well, that would make life well. People easy. do put them up intranasally for sure, uh -huh. and um, I know there are people trying to do them. They do them orally. They make the patient hold it in their mouths. That's, um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's probably very inefficient. But I have heard from Johan that. Um, when he, he can find bovine, um, I think they're messenger RNA fragments, in very small amounts in meat eaters compared to vegetarians. So there is some transfer, but whether it's enough to be functional, I think everybody's in doubt about, yeah. Yeah, that just sort of blows you away, thinking that all of this would get immediately digested in the GI tract, and you would never in a million years uh, get any kind of RNAs well, into the circulation. Yeah, but, but remember, everybody's taking it up along the way, so I think it, maybe it's getting taken up as it, it goes down the esophagus mm -hmm. bef before it hits the stomach. I think when it hits the stomach, it's probably, they're probably gonna be. Still um, has to get across an epithelium that you wouldn't have thought would be very friendly to receipt of this kind of material. But yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Over here. So Sandra, first, thanks for deconflating microglia and macrophages. <laughs> <laughs> because that happens a lot. But what I'm especially interested in is, you know, this novel function of the, mac of the microglia in the tumor Microglia respond, as you pointed out, to a lot of different stimuli. So when you look at the transcriptome of the microglia, how does it compare to tumor-derived microglia versus microglia that might have been activated by some other insult? Oh, well, to well it's, so it's very different. You know, they used to say it was the M1 and the M2 class. Well, that's sort of the, the M2 right. class. Now, like Joe El Khoury says, the at least 13 different right, states it's, it's the microglia all, can enter, enter, and that the scleroblastoma state is another one again. They are, when, when the microglia are in the context of the brain tumor, and you know, whether it's because they're very close to the tumor cells or whether they, and maybe that's why they took up more vesicles, I don't know, we can't really blame the vesicles at this point, but they really um, become pathetic in their, <laughs> you know, what, what they were supposed to be doing. They, they don't do anything, except for, you know, support the tumor, so. Thanks, and over here. Yeah, just a point, in terms of, of having done pathology some time ago and dealing with glioblastoma multiform and all of these type of things, uh, I remember how difficult it was to even make a diagnosis after treatment, that it had actually regressed or you've actually been successful. So I think the micro uh, vesicles in the blood, I'm not even sure, I haven't seen the literature lately, might be a good uh, in addition to the follow-up, making sure that you've actually treated it successfully. So I think in that in that, to that extent, that it's a very successful, I mean, it's a, it's a real step forward for pathologists who are just scratching their heads, giving entire conferences as to whether this is necrosis, this is radiation right, effect, or right, this is glioblastoma right. multiform. I can attest to actually presenting a case where nobody could figure it out, and mm. I'm, not, I'm not sure how they acted on it. The second thing is in, when you're talking about the uh, microvesicles, there's a good deal of literature now going towards synthetic biology where actually you can create cells. And it, it, I'm wondering how that would apply now to the, 
vesicles, would you think that that would be a, is, is, is that what they're pr uh, principally using now, or are they going well, to just put it Well, I would say there's in? a big movement, you know, there were a big, a lot of people involved in either nanoparticle delivery or liposome delivery, and now they're trying to incorporate some of the features, some of the proteins, some of the lipids that distinguish the extracellular vesicles into the liposomes especially. I just heard one a talk today where they try to just fuse them together. They fuse their liposomes with the EVs in the hopes of gaining some of these properties which are, well, EVs are not very toxic at all. Normally they're um, very stable. Um, cells avidly take them up. You know, They seem to have a way of getting their contents out into the cytoplasm, which can be a problem. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of people that, that see that really as the future, that to learn from the EBs and to figure out what components of them can be included in a synthetic vesicle. Yeah, there is one paper out where, I forgot what the name of the guy is, he's here, the other guy who did the genome, uh, Dr. Venter, I think, mm -hmm. and he, I think he's actually created a cell that, that mimics, an, or he or somebody else created yeah. one that mimics the simplest microorganism, and I forgot what the name of the most simple microorganism is. but. I, mm. I, it's the simplest of the simplest, but I think they've mimicked it pretty well. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I was just wondering, uh, in addition to delivering uh, toxic chemicals or toxic molecules into the cells, what about targeting the bio, biosynthesis or biogenesis of the exosomes in the tumor cells? Yeah, How would that would be feasible? People would love to do that, just to... Uh, do Cox postulates, right? So if you say, I think it's the vesicles that are causing this, you'd like to be able to stop vesicle release and see if you still get it. But the problem is if you stop vesicle release, first of all, you, nobody's figured out how to do it because they, they seem to get around it one way or the other. The cell doesn't like it, right? So it's very hard. It's, it, you, it's easier to prevent uptake, um, but very, very hard to block release. And I'm, I forget exactly what your question. You had another aspect to that. The mic. Thank because you. it seems that the the bio, biogenesis pathways involve a lot of the escort complex or escort independent complex. Would that help in terms of specific targeting those components in the, I mean, like the GBM cells or other cancer cell types? Yeah. Well, for instance, we tried that. So the multifascicular pathway. Um, uses this Rab twenty seven A to get release that was work shown by other people. And so we tried to block that pathway in the glioblastoma cells to see if they would grow as well as tumors, and they actually seem to grow as well as tumors. They may not invade as much. It's very, yeah, very dicey. I had a question about the lipid bilayer of these vesicles. The plasma membrane lipid bilayer is thicker than the, the Golgi lipid bilayer. That's how the sorting of the proteins takes place because the smaller transmembrane domain of the proteins, they go into the endoplasmatic reticulum, oil is the one, but the longer ones go into the plasma membrane. My question is this, how, what is the lipid bilayer thickness of the vesicles and how is the sorting of these proteins taking place? That is like a hugely important question and I can't personally answer it. Uh, we have a talk at the American Society of Gene Cell Therapy by Anastasia Korova, who has looked into the lipids. The lipid composition of the vesicles is different from the plasma membrane, and they tend to shift phosphoserine out to the surface. They have higher cholesterol. They, they, it, the whole lipid thing is very different in them, and uh, people are not that many people have studied it to date, but I think it's a critical issue. Okay. Great. Maybe one final question, Cassandra, for you, just in terms of this whole field of extracellular vesicles. Again, the Common Fund's been supporting this effort, and lots of interesting things coming out of it in terms of what these might be doing in cancer, but also as maybe a new form of endocrinology where they're sending signals from one mm, part of the body mm. to another, uh, or it, maybe even at a distance and not just locally. What, what do you see as the most important next steps uh, for this particular field uh, to bring it forward into wherever it needs to go uh, to fully understand what these vesicles are doing and how to utilize those uh, for medical purposes? Yeah, I mean, I think right now the biggest embarrassment is, first of all, we don't know how many different types of vesicles they are and what their contents are. Uh, quantification, which is what Jennifer Jones has worked on, is still, we can't even count them properly. Um, we, it's very hard to label them properly, mm -hmm. labels that um, 
first of all, you know, if you label them like we do with our fluorescent protein, once they get taken up into the cell and they actually get released, you can't see the fluorescent protein anymore. People use dyes, but the dyes aggregate, and you look at, you think you're looking at a vesicle, but you're looking at an aggregated dye. We, we may, anyway, we, we, can't, we haven't got good ways to label them. We haven't got good ways to separate them. Uh, and until I think we can do that, you know, how are we going to say? For instance, we know now that on average there's one microRNA per vesicle, okay? But are they, out if you took like 100 vesicles, is it all in one vesicle? And if so, what kind? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's almost embarrassing, really. <laughs> that we don't know about these vesicles. So a lot of technology yes. development still yes. needed in yeah, order to yeah. fully get your mind. But it sounds like a lot of the problem also is that this is very heterogeneous. You can't just say, well, okay, now we have figured out what vesicles are doing because right, there's right. all these different types with all these different potential functions. But people have to, like you talk, I mean, just to give one example of a long distance effect, if somebody has um, HIV, they, there's data showing that their vesicles can actually sensitize the liver. Vesicles produced by the infected cells, and, but not the virus itself, can sensitize the liver to, a, to HIV infection. So there's, there are indications that they do travel great distances. And, Much to stay tuned. Yeah. Well, Sandra, thank you for walking us through some very well, interesting applications and raising our consciousness about an exciting field. <laughs> Please let's thank Dr. Brakefield thank again. Thank you so much. Yeah.